the city of Rhodes itself was already one of the most impregnable in the Mediterranean, thanks to centuries of conflict and conquest. The town was surrounded by high defensive walls, which the knights reinforced with freestanding towers. Outside, a moat more than 150 feet wide and 200 feet deep was created to trap any enemy attempting to scale its walls. In addition to the island of Rhodes, the knights also claimed and fortified the other smaller islands surrounding them, providing an effective barrier to curtail Muslim navigation of the Mediterranean. But it was their fleet the knights relied on first and foremost. While it boasted only seven ships, their captains and crews were feared and respected by all. Strict rules governed the galleys. It was hard, dangerous work, we must remember that the knight's strategy of attack was based on boarding the enemy vessel in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was also the fastest way for a young knight to achieve the required three caravans or tours of duty, so necessary to win promotion to higher offices. The Knights of St. John grew ever stronger. By the middle of the 15th century, there were 400 knights on the island with a far larger number of squires, fighting men, and assorted supporters. Their presence on roads did not go unnoticed. There had been constant raids by the Turks since their arrival, and constant forays by the knights, who roved the sea attacking Turkish ships and ports. In 1453, Constantinople, the last Christian bastion in the east, fell to Sultan Mehmet II. Now there was little standing between the Muslim Turks and their ultimate goal, Rome itself. But first, Mehmet declared he would teach a lesson to the little stronghold of knights on roads who dared to stand guard over the sea. On a May morning in 1480, sentries on duty in the watchtowers of Rhodes saw more than 160 ships carrying 100,000 sons of Islam, intent upon annihilation of the Knights of St. John. On the island, Grandmaster Fra Pierre d'Aboussin had at his disposal 600 knights, about 2,000 troops, plus the citizens of Rhodes. The odds were staggering, but all too familiar to the Knights of St. John. Resolutely, Dabusan reminded his men of their vows. Then they waited. First, the enemy focused on the city of Rhodes itself, raining down more than 3,500 stone spheres, each weighing 1,000 pounds or more. Finally, on July 27th, a part of the city wall was reduced to rubble. Through the breach poured the Turks. But as they had so often in the Holy Land, the knights regrouped and displayed the courage they were famous for. Even the aging Dabusan, though seriously wounded, led a group of knights over the walls and after the enemy, finally capturing the banner of the Grand Turk. Their resolution forced the Turks to abandon the battle. Mehmet II died a bitter man and directed his epitaph to acknowledge it with the words, I intended to conquer Rhodes and to subdue Italy. Thanks to the Knights of St. John, he accomplished neither one. Rhodes and Rome were both safe for the moment. But the tide was shifting in favor of the Turks. In 1520, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent rose to the throne of the Ottoman Turks. He was to become perhaps the most implacable enemy of Christendom and of the Knights Hospitaller. In the summer of 1522, Suleiman's army arrived off Rhodes with hundreds of ships and more men than even Mehmed II had gathered, all intent on finishing the Knights of St. John. The first efforts of the Turk were in vain, although their bombardment of the city surely tested the faith of the defenders. 
But by September, the enemy finally succeeded in breaching the walls of the English Lang. And once more, Turks poured through the defenses of Rhodes. It appeared all was lost, but the legendary courage of the knights turned the tide and did so again 20 days later when they forced the Turks back. By that night, more than 15,000 Turks lay dead, but the knights still held the city. By December, it was a desperate situation. The citizens of Rhodes had reached the breaking point. They demanded the knights talk truce. Despite arguments within the order, the Grand Master finally sent a deputation to meet with Suleiman. The Sultan greeted his adversaries with respect. He agreed to the Grand Master's request, and on January 1st, 1523, the Knights of St. John Hospitaller left Rhodes forever. Suleiman himself provided the ships necessary for the evacuation. So great was his admiration of the little band that had held out so long against such great odds. It was a chivalrous gesture he would come to regret. <laughs>